And by my watch, it is about that time. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Celine Figueroa, and I am with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I am so excited uh, and grateful for you all joining us for our monthly Indigenous <coughs> film series. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science is pleased to partner with the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management and the Denver American Indian Commission to present Indigenous film. As you're watching that presentation tonight, go ahead and put your questions and comments in the chat. You might not be able to see each other's chats, but we can see them and we'll be monitoring them throughout the program to see what you all have to say. To begin tonight's event, I'd like to introduce Jean Rubin, Director of the Indigenous Film and Arts Festival. Jean. Thank you, Celine. Uh, Welcome everybody. Uh, with me is Merv Tano. He is the president of the International Institute for Indigenous Resource Management. He is also a commissioner on the American, the Denver American Indian Commission. So we have all of our presenting partners represented tonight. Uh, we, I want to acknowledge our sponsors. Mile High Behavioral Healthcare is sponsoring our annual monthly Indigenous film series again this year. Many thanks to them. And Kubo Jazz is on board this year again as our media sponsor. Our program tonight is an evening with Greg Deal and Greg will be joining us as our guest. I've known Greg for a number of years and the first time I asked him for a, a short bio, he sent me an artist statement and it started with a sentence that you don't usually see in an artist statement, but it tells you a lot about what is important to Greg. Greg is a husband, father, artist, and member of the Paiute tribe of Pyramid Lake. Uh, more than an artist, he is an activist artist. Much of his work deals with indigenous identity and pop culture, touching on issues such as race relations, historical consideration, and stereotypes. Through his work, which includes paintings, murals, print work, and performance art, Greg critically examines current issues in Indian country, issues such as decolonization, the mascot issue, both locally and nationally, and cultural appropriation. Greg has an impressive CV. He was um, a Native, art, Native Arts artist in residence at the Denver Art Museum. He was an artist in residence in Berkeley. His work has been exhibited nationally since 2002. Uh, including at such prestigious institutions as the Smithsonian. Uh, he had work in their Cross Lines exhibit, uh, which was uh, in Washington, D.C. in 2016. And you may have seen his work uh, locally, from murals to gallery exhibits. Uh, his work has been shown in Colorado Springs, in Boulder, in Denver. Of course, one of my personal favorites uh, was his 2017 exhibit, Not Your Indian, at our 14th annual Indigenous Film and Arts Festival when he was, was our featured artist. I will stop here so that we have time for the program, but I encourage you to visit his website, gregdeal.com, and I know Celine is going to put that up in the chat room. Uh, you, you will find a much more extensive CV for Greg, uh, learn more about his career. You'll also see some of his artwork, and he has work for sale. So tonight, uh, tonight's program, we're going to start with Greg's film, The Last American Indian on Earth. It's a 22 minute film that he made. And then when we come back from that, uh, we'll introduce Greg and start our conversation. So with that, let's roll the film. You may recognize some of these photographs. Classic images taken in the early 1900s. These images were taken by Edward Sheriff Curtis, an American photographer. His fame was built upon these images, which became part of the romantic narrative of America and Western culture at large. In order to create this incredible sense of romanticism, Ed Curtis paid natives to pose, often dressing them, and items to perpetuate identity through costume and headdresses he deemed fit 
ultimately defining the indigenous stereotype that still exists today. Curtis famously said of his work, I wanna make them live forever, thus supplanting the relic, an image and concept that has never really allowed indigenous people to be modern. He took indigenous stories and likenesses upon his shoulders because he felt he needed to document the vanishing race. And Curtis is among those who've been privileged to witness something that does not belong to them, but feel it's his right to take that story, pervert it by their own ideals, misconceptions and perceptions, holding themselves up as the savior and teller of stories about those they deem unfit to tell themselves. In truth, there are people in this world that when confronted with our image, cannot help themselves. Days, like Thanksgiving lies and Columbus Day. Tell me what I know more than the teacher. Tell me what I know more than the preacher. Tell me why you think the red man is red. Stained with the blood from the land he bled. Tell me why you think the red man is dead. With the fake headdress on your head. Tell me what you know about thousands of nations. So the last American Indian on Earth is a performance art piece I started in the summer of 2013. The concept was about taking an outfit that embodies the indigenous stereotype. The headdress is central to that, of course. Um, you know, few things are quintessentially Indian in America than a headdress. The whole outfit's fake. It's made in China and not real indigenous regalia, which is okay because all I really need to do is fit the American image of what they often believe an Indian is. So my goal was to document reactions that average Americans would have to this image. At first, you know, when we started this, my equipment wasn't perfect. So the focus was on photographs. Um, my wife, Megan, uh, took all the initial images and my good friend, E-Man, he shot video so that there was at least some documentation. And the images were perfect, but we quickly began to realize that the video was volatile and almost completely unbelievable unless you're looking at it with your own eyes. But with just a few seconds of video, I knew this was bigger than the photos or even just a standalone performance piece. Hey, I, I was wondering, I was wondering what uh, compelled you to do that sound with your mouth. Just now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah why, why'd you do, why did you feel the need to do that? Oh yeah? yeah? Do you think that's offensive at all to Native Americans when you uh, do that? Well, no, no, actually, because I'm a Redskins fan. So I have some good images and some rough video. It was enough to get me into the Huffington Post and garner interest from the Washington Post. It was at about this time that I met a graduate student named Dakota, who was working on his master's in photojournalism. He was the upgrade that I needed because of the equipment that he had. So we made an agreement. He would use me as his master's thesis and in turn give me access and the rights that I needed to the photos and the footage for my final piece, which I had mentioned in the Huffington Post, a film. It was clear that my interaction documentation game went up and I could concentrate on the performances and the various social concepts therein. And when you let those cameras roll, Americans, they do not disappoint. You don't look any different. Than what? Than in any other American. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. What kind of hair do you have? It's dark. Is it straight? Yeah. Yeah. Are you pure Indian? I'm half. You no. Know, is there any intermarriage? Yes, I'm half. You're half it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're half Indian and half white. Mm -hmm. White. White. Oh, that. That's why I said, do you know? So you're not a hundred percent. No, ma'am. Are there any hundred percent left? Of course. Still. Mm -hmm. I think I saw Indians when I went out with. And do you, the half of the family that's Indian, do you relate to better? Um, it's family. I mean, I suppose uh, you, I relate to it just as much as I relate to any other family. So it's, I'm, I'm certain it's no different than your family. This, my friends, is what dehumanization looks like. 
the older woman states with great surprise that I look like any other American. The assumption being that somehow we're not human and she's surprised to see an Indian up close and that Indian is in fact a human being. She then begins to weigh and measure my features and questioned the percentage of Indian I am as though trying to decide if I'm Indian enough to matter. Her counterpart then begins to ask how I can relate to my other half if I identify as Indian, as though relating to each other as human beings is an impossibility. It reminds me of the time that someone once said to me that half-breeds have no place in society because they're neither one nor the other. Hey, easy. Can you get a picture with you? Sure. So how's, how's it glowing? But things aren't always bad. Sometimes people just want to get a picture with you. And illustrate that I'm actually not being sensitive, that it's actually a real issue that's happening and that people have this relationship, like America as a whole has a relationship with indigenous people that is socially retarded. And, uh, and, and that's important. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Can I get your picture? Sure. Thank you. Hey. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Can you get pictures? Sure. Okay. Hey. Go in. Act like you love her. These are seemingly just simple photographs, something that's easily had with the accessibility of cameras nowadays. But there has to be a question about the commodification of the indigenous image. There could be an argument where someone says that I'm asking for it because I'm dressed a certain way. But simply being dressed this way begets a very specific reaction that almost never exists with any other group or ethnicity. In fact, I'm pretty sure I would never get this kind of reaction in public unless I was naked. I saw you, man. There had to be. Wait, you mind? What? What's, what's up with the outfit? Just shopping today. Oh, okay. Yeah. We don't see very many Indians coming through. That's all. It's it's true. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Can I take a picture? Yeah. And this can even be true with me. Sometimes I want the picture. Can I get a picture with you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Josh, nice to meet you. Michael, good to meet you guys. So I think I'm gonna go bomb this couple's wedding photos. <laughs> <laughs> Now there's another thing that came up in this performance piece that I never intended on, and that is having an opinion about the Washington football team. Having lived in the Washington DC area for over a decade and a half, I suppose it was bound to come up. It was certainly tied together by local news and media, and I was being asked to voice my opinion, which incidentally was pretty strongly opposed to racial slurs and disembodied heads on the side of helmets. And next thing I know, I'm being called an activist. Back at 247, while the nation's capital struggles with the issue of what to call the Washington football team, a performance art piece and social project that explores how people's stereotype, people stereotype Native Americans. So you come at this from a number of, of different uh, directions. But as an artist, first of all, Americans have a lot of different and conflicted feelings. Native Americans and non-Native born Americans sure. about how all this goes. Tell me what your feeling is right now. Is the Redskins name offensive? Should it be changed? Looking back now, I can say that at this exact moment right here, I knew I needed to be very open and very public with my opinion in disavowing the Washington football team, not just as an indigenous man or as a 17 year resident of the Washington DC area, but as a father to indigenous children. Um, I, what are we talking about here? I mean, we're talking about um, a dialogue. So I found myself on a couple of local spots. I was invited onto Kamau Bell's 
uh, totally biased on FX in New York City, and then ultimately was a part of a Native American panel that was invited onto The Daily Show. Why was this group of Native American activists so upset? It's a name that um, impairs, disables, disenfranchises uh, our, our population. In my mind, all of this comes in second to the opportunity to stand shoulder to shoulder with other indigenous people and non-natives in an effort to enact change. Standing on a stage in Minneapolis in front of 5,000 people and seeing the amount of people that wanted change to eliminate stereotypes and mascots and the use of racial slurs was pretty overwhelming. So what is the elimination of indigenous mascots, the desire to eliminate popular stereotypes have to do with a performance art piece called The Last American Indian on Earth. It really has almost everything to do with it. This performance art piece is about dehumanization and stereotype, about the image that is perpetuated through American culture that can only exist in a headdress or a single feather coming from the back of your head that you have to look a certain way, you have to dress a certain way, and you have to talk a certain way in order to be considered an indigenous person. The performance of this piece isn't really me. It's really everybody else. It's like a performance art piece that's actually in the form of a social mirror. I can show you how deep-seated the misconceptions are among Americans and in American culture. I mean, so deep-seated, in fact, that there is a football team with a racial slur as its name. But for the year that I did this piece, nobody illustrated how incredibly inept Americans are in understanding Indigenous people and understanding the place that Indigenous people have been thrust into through colonization, misunderstanding, and miseducation than this I woman. What are you? I'm what tribe are you from, sir? Northern. I am part Cherokee. I just want you to know that. And I don't go walking around in. Well, I'm a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. Are you really? Where my mother was born. And does that deserve a high five? Yes. Yes. <laughs> sure. I can take a picture. Are you serious? Yeah. Every day of my life. Who sent you? Police Department. I'm just out sightseeing. Secret Service. Yeah. FBI. Indians don't really have a good relationship with FBI or <laughs> police. So. Can I, you're, you're part of me. You know, you're, we feel about you the same way that we feel about, um, uh, we feel about you the same way we feel about Africans in our mother country that we don't know who they are, but we know that we're a part of them. Mm -hmm. And you know what they used to call me when I went to work? Tell me. Oh God. Wow. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is your your your? Uh, I was getting to say slave name. No, it's not. I, I don't. My slave name is is, is Paige. Mm. But um, that was the name of my British slave owners mm -hmm. years ago. They they named us Paige. But um, now what is the name of what is your tribe name? It's Greg. No. no. Yeah. Running cloud. Red River, something that I can keep in my heart. How about Walking Eagle? Oh, whoa. Is that right? Is that the truth? Yeah, yeah. Walking Eagle? Mm -hmm. Jeez, man. That is so neat. <laughs> While Pocahontas Page may seem extreme, she's also an incredible representation of how people often interact with Indigenous people. I dare say that the majority of Natives have had some element of this type of interaction and amplified even more so when wearing regalia or perceived regalia. But what's interesting is how this starts. Pocahontas Page starts with self-righteous indignation, claiming to be part Cherokee and is upset at what I'm wearing. At the exact moment she discovers that I am, in fact, Native, she takes a bucket of romanticism and she dumps it over her head, changing her disposition to something that doesn't even come close to resembling how this began. She's cooing, leaning on me and touching me, a good illustration of how Natives in general are objectified, an objectification not dictated by gender. 
And of course, it must be said that when she asks my Indian name, I give her the old Charlie Hill joke, a native comedian. The only time an eagle walks is when it's too full of crap to fly. And that was the last day that I worked as the last American Indian on earth. Now, if you remember, Dakota and I were working together on this for mutual benefit. He for his master's thesis and me to produce a film. This was of vital importance because oftentimes indigenous people don't get to tell their own stories. And I felt that this story was something that needed to be told. Dakota had to produce a video for his master's thesis presentation, a video with which had a significant amount of footage that predated our friendship that I gave to him with permission for his presentation. Once he was done with his presentation for his master's thesis, he was so proud of the film that he created that he submitted it to the DC Shorts Film Festival. He listed himself as the director, used the footage that we shot together as well as the footage that predated our relationship, and he called his film The Last American Indian on Earth, thus undermining my efforts to create a film to tell an indigenous story from an indigenous perspective. When I confronted Dakota, he dismissed it, stated something along the lines of some journalistic concept of having the right to tell the story that he witnessed. His film played the sad bastard Indian finding himself through his art narrative, an obvious narrative for somebody wrapped up in colonialism and their own racial superiority. And you know, once I got past being angry about the outcome of this project, I realized something. Much like Edward Curtis and the thousands of non-natives that followed him, the romanticized narrative of indigenous people is uncontrollably attractive. Adding in a dose of American culture, something that has significant traces of racial superiority, misplaced benevolence, and a misunderstanding of America's first peoples coupled with a desire to continually take things that do not belong to them, even something as simple as a story. We see repeats of history that continue today. And in realizing that someone like Dakota sees this image is privy to the process and the story, the truth is he cannot help himself. Once you get past that, I suddenly realized that this was an absolute perfect ending to a story about this image that exists within Western culture and how indigenous people are not allowed to own our own image or even tell our own stories. And this is me telling my own story, despite what happened, and seeing that Dakota is part of the story. He's part of the narrative of the last American Indian on earth. And in all of this, I felt incredibly assured about my work. The use of art, and more specifically performance art, is another step in the dialogue of asserting that identity in an effort to empower ourselves, and even more importantly, our children. That is something nons seem to miss in all of this. They focus on indigenous people forgetting the past and how we need to get over it. An interesting notion when every September 11th, we're told to never forget. There is power in knowing our history, good, bad, or indifferent. We are empowered by it. We are propelled by it. And everything we do now isn't for us, but for our children and our children's children. We are rising up and creating change in our communities and throughout the land that we call North America. We recognize that this is Indian land, that we are a covenanted people in the space that the creator has given us, that we are stewards over this land and we will continue to grow and rise and empower ourselves through knowledge of history and of self, overcoming ethnic genocide. We know where we came from. We know how we got here. The policies that have been put in place throughout American history have been policies of elimination. Simply knowing that means knowing that our very existence is a protest, and we will protest for as long as we carry breath. To know you. To know your voice, to know you makes me whole, it makes me whole. Danced in dirt and smoke, you don't listen. So loud in the name of Christian. An honest time we've waited. Breath held up, it was baited. Seven lives anticipated. Get over it by now. Lead me on my feet. Keep moving.
mother's crying Brother, you left your shoes I sleep to missing you Slander and abuse Hold on to it somehow Lead me Wow, fantastic film. We, oh, I, I wait for the applause. We don't get the applause. <laughs> People type in, you, type in your applause. So um, everybody, this is uh, Greg Deal that you saw in the film and the filmmaker. Greg, you, you spoke to uh, the, the issue of uh, native land and stolen land. So um, can we start with uh, a land acknowledgement from you? Yeah. Um, uh, Greg Deal, Minani, New Kuyui Takata. My name is Greg Deal. I'm a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, uh, which is in the Great Basin area of uh, Nevada. Um, and I want to acknowledge that we are on the uh, ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne and the Arapaho and the Ute. Um, and, and it's becoming commonplace to do these land acknowledgements. And so I also want to, um, to say that uh, it's important that, that you do more than just an acknowledgement. Um, we uh, have some links. I don't know if you can see those links or if those links can go up um, for three different organizations. Um, the Sovereign Bodies Institute actually does all of the um, a lot of the research and things that are being used for the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women in the United States and in Canada, and even in Central and South America, um, providing a lot of important information for tribal communities who are trying to combat uh, this, this terrible thing that's happening uh, within our communities of uh, women and children and uh, two spirit being at a higher rate of um, of assault, uh, sexual assault and murder. Uh, Illuminatives is another one, uh, which is specifically uh, working on uh, helping with representation and the statistics and the research that goes into helping non-native folks understand why this stuff matters. Um, because from a scientific point of view, um, it is still incredibly important. And uh, for something more local, uh, the Hasea, uh, Resource Center is um, a local women's shelter in Colorado Springs, the only indigenous women's shelter uh, that um, helps uh, women that are in a tough situation, uh, helps their children get into, uh, them and their children get into better situations. So if you feel uh, that you want to give back, those are some small ways to do it. Um, you can also buy art if you want. So that's always uh, a nice thing too. But um, but I think it's important to realize that um, words are sort of like words are sort of like a drawing. Um, a drawing is the beginning of something. Uh, usually, a painting is the finish, and so it's important to to finish the whole process and not just make the land recognition, but to also uh, recognize um, how important it is uh, to have action that contributes to indigenous liberation and equality. Gina, I'm adding one more thing to the chat, and that's going to be the Indigenous uh, Film Virtual Donation Bucket, which benefits the IIIRM for us. Thank you. So this is actually a, a piece of Greg's artwork that uh, speaks to the land issue. And it says, uh, Indian land for sale, it, it, which is actually part of a uh, like a newspaper announcement that was during the westward expansion. That's uh, one way people were enticed to go out and homestead was Indian land for sale. You may wonder how do you sell Indian land if you're not, <laughs> you, you steal it for yourself and then you sell it. So Murph, you wanna get our conversation going? Sure, uh, Murph Tano. I haven't watched this uh, for uh, a while, Greg, and uh, uh, still strikes me as a very uh, powerful piece. 
on, on one hand, it's a uh, uh, it's, it's very personal in the sense it's a memoir, uh, but also uh, it's uh, metaphorical in a sense. Uh, the idea of the last uh, Indian. I mean, but what has happened in the last year is uh, what has been historical and then metaphorical uh, is becoming reality again uh, with the way uh, this uh, foul disease has, a, has affected uh, Indian country. Mm. And I, I, I asked a question uh, to you because I've, I've pondered it. Uh, what, what's the role of Native artists such as yourself uh, in conjunction with uh, cultural institutions, educational institutions, such as museums, uh, uh, universities, colleges, et cetera, uh, to, to address this? Uh, because it is, it is real, we are losing uh, people who, who speak the language, have uh, just uh, are enormous reservoir of, of traditional knowledge and wisdom, and they're, and they're going. Uh, so let me ask you that question. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I say that, I mean, as I, you know, sit here and speak with, with a surety, um, but I think that we're entering into new spaces. Um, we are the most visible, invisible group of people in the United States. Um, everybody knows who and what we are, and most folks are assured about those things um, and don't have really any reference to our modern existence. I mean, they may know somebody, um, but don't realize that there is a, a myriad of issues that are just barely starting to come to the surface. And so, you know, the, the place of artists or even thinkers or um, any native person uh, is still being defined and has been uh, an upward, uh, an uphill battle up to this point. Um, events like Black Lives Matter last summer, uh, I'm noticing is starting, is starting to shift the tides to uh, opening doors in places that have never been opened before um, or opening them, opening them wider than they've been opened. But there's so much context that's missing in our modern existence that it's nearly impossible to explain to somebody uh, our existence, how this works, or how something like COVID-19 would affect our communities or why it would affect our communities. Um, how is that tied to uh, equity? How is that tied to um, uh, the way that we have been historically disenfranchised and uh, just by all intents and purposes pushed into a corner and forgotten about. Um, the, the context that's missing on our modern existence has been uh, so subversive and just so non-existent um, that it feels like we're having this conversation for the first time every time we have it. Yes. And so we have to provide so much information and so much background to even bring people up to speed enough to explain why something like COVID is happening or why these things are important or why you would even do a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to think we're progressing forward. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter did a lot for a lot of people that are in, in more or less the same boat as, um, as Black folks in the United States. But there's still so much, so much to do and in realizing what needs to happen with that. So um, I'd like to think that I contribute to a little bit of that context, but um, you know, folks are, folks know way more about Christopher Columbus than they do about the Taino people who he came into contact with. I think that's a good example of, of how um, history ha is being taught where one thing is more important than another. And if you teach that, I mean, it becomes propagandized to such a degree that it's impossible to help people break out of that to understand a, a parallel truth that happens at the same exact time. Thank you. I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's a, yeah, thanks. It's, you know, there's, there's no real simple uh, uh, answer, uh, but uh, certainly have... Uh, <laughs> 
given me uh, some some ideas uh, to pursue because I've been I've been chewing on this uh, notion for uh, for uh, for a year now. Yeah. Take some audience questions. Yeah, audience um, questions. Yeah. So somebody asked, uh, wants to know if you can explain the significance of the black handprint on your face. Um, I saw it in a George Catlin painting once and uh, thought it was a good idea. Um, I mean, the, the handprint has existed in multiple places uh, for like Plains uh, natives. Um, handprint like on the rump of a horse means that you you outflanked your enemy before. Um, so it could be that. The symbolism could also be about being silenced. Um, but there's actually a practical purpose to it. Um, I'm about six foot four, you know, I'm wearing that damn headdress and, and I'm over seven feet tall. And um, having a face makeup on your face is um, like it is in, in most indigenous cultures, um, is meant to be used to intimidate your enemy. And, um, and so the practical purpose is having something on my face that takes away from somebody's ability to see my face past that. Um, and I'd also always wear sunglasses for that performance piece because um, it would actually give me power over the people I was talking to because they can't perceive me, they can't see my eyes. Um, and so uh, there's a practical purpose to it as well. Um, there's other kinds of face paint that I could have done. Um, honestly, that one's, you know, it's pretty, pretty fast in comparison to some of the other styles uh, that I could have, that I could have done. Um, I like the symbol, like the symbolism of it, you know, sort of being silenced. Um, I've used it in multiple performance pieces. And uh, one of our viewers um, is making the point that that's also a symbol that's been adopted by the um, the movement around the murdered and missing Indian women, right. and that's indicating that you know these are women who have been silenced. Yeah, um, and I think that's a, an important note as well. I mean, that's happened. Uh, I mean, well within my lifetime, that's a that's a new symbol that has popped up, but it's been also um, incredibly important. I know a couple of native um, uh, activists and, and, uh, even athletes that will put the handprint on their face and then run a race. Um, and so they're raising awareness by having that. So it's, it's, the symbolism is great, but it's so stark that, uh, folks can see it and, um, sort of react to it almost immediately. It's, it's not very subversive. It's pretty much, it's pretty out there. Someone asked the question that uh, if Dakota had credited you in his piece, would that have been enough? No, no, absolutely not. Um, because when when Dakota and I met, and, and I don't get too into it in the film, uh, for the film, I was trying really hard to stick with uh, verifiable facts and not kind of give too much of, of my opinion. Um, at, at the behest of a, a lawyer that, that I spoke to. <laughs> um, but uh, when we first met, um, I voiced, because I had actually said before we met that I was going to make a film about this piece. And then when, when he and I met after that statement was made um, and, and in print with the Huffington Post in 2013, um, he uh, and I met and I said, you know, I'm making a film, I do not want you to steal it. Like this is something that is really important and need you to understand. And, and he, he assured me that he understood that. Um, when he put his, his uh, video presentation together for his master's thesis, he was very proud of it and he wanted to move forward with it. The, the problem with his piece is it completely eliminates my voice, which eliminates the entire purpose of this piece, which is to have an indigenous voice informing everything that's happening. And the fact that his storyline for his original piece took this sort of like, I found myself through my art narrative completely takes out the fact that one, I already know who I am. Um, two, I'm, I'm self-assured in uh, who I am, not just uh, in my presence, but also in my knowledge. Um, and uh, he took a trope that actually exists within cinema about the poor disenfranchised minority that is on a journey to discover themselves through whatever means is in front of them. And it's crap, it's, it's low hanging fruit and it, and it misses the nuance of the piece. And, uh, and so that was really important to me um, and, and, and he ruined it. 
because I, he was at the time my ride or die, like we were going to continue to work together, uh, for anything. I'm looking for people that are loyal in my life that I can work with, that we can, you know, build something together. Um, and that will also enrich my work. And, um, because of what he did, uh, and because of sort of, uh, we didn't sign agreements, which of course is the hard lesson I learned in the process as well. Um, that's why I generally put the film out for viewing for free, uh, so that I don't have to give him anything because I made a promise to him that I'd split everything and that I would give him full credit as director of photography. If you actually look at the credits, he's listed in there, um, under that. And I did that because I feel that the integrity of our agreement is, is paramount and, um, want to stick with that. But, um, no, him, him crediting me, it doesn't mean anything. He lost the point and was too, um, I think he was just too eager to, to do anything except just whatever it is he did. So, um, so no, that was a really long way of just saying no. <laughs> oh, we like, we like the long way. Um, uh, someone wanted to know was when you were doing that performance piece, did you ever have an interaction with folks that impressed you in a good way? And I want to yeah. add my own my own tag onto that. Did you ever have some native person that wanted to bring you aside and say, "Hey, guy, do you know this is crap that you're wearing?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, all those things. Um, it was rare when somebody would say something. I would often treat people the way that they would treat me. So, um, if somebody was rude, then I would just like just let them talk. Just let them sort of you know give them enough rope. Let them hang themselves. Um, there were people that were kind and would sort of give a nod here and there. Um, what's really difficult with this, this style of filmmaking, cause it's sort of guerrilla style. I have a microphone and it can pick up a lot of things that are around me. Um, but it misses a lot of, a lot of, uh, little things that you might not be able to catch. Cause there was some really terrible things that happened when I was out there. Um, that I wasn't able to, we weren't able to capture. And, um, and so uh, likewise, you know, if somebody gives a knowing nod or says, you know, hey, uh, like, I, I think I understand this, that's cool. Like, it, those things were actually really hard to, to capture. Um, but it was, I, I suppose it's a little hyperbolic, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, concentrating on the negatives. If I'm honest, um, the negatives far outweighed the positives uh, within this, especially in Washington, DC. Um, if I were to break it down, it'd be like 20, 80, 80% uh, bad, 20% okay. Um, and so, or I would say tolerable to good, 20%. And, um, and so it was, it was a tough thing to do, but yeah, that was, that was sort of the situation. And like I said, I mean, I was honest with people. If somebody came up to me and they're like, they're like, I mean, I think I understand what you're doing, but like what, you know, can you explain to me what you're doing? And, and, and I would explain to him, you know, this is a performance art piece and, you know, documenting it in all these different ways. And, uh, and then people would, um, you know, they would react, uh, you know, accordingly. And um, most of the time people were like taking selfies with me without ever acknowledging me or talking to me. Um, they're hitting their mouths, doing the sort of Hollywood, uh, you know, war cry thing. Um, so there, those things all existed, uh, within that as well, which was, uh, clearly very problematic. So it was a mixed bag. Um, and yes, uh, natives, um, man, I was scared to death. I was going to run into a native person. I wasn't going to be able to explain what I was doing fast enough, <laughs> uh, you know, to, cause it looks really bad. And, um, the first day I went out, I ran into a, a couple of young women from, uh, from Oregon, I think, if I remember correctly. And they were like, I mean, what the hell? <laughs> and uh, I explained it to them and they were like, oh, that's cool. That's really cool. And um, and I think they followed me on social media and, you know, we, we talked once or twice since then. Uh, but um, yeah, that was always my fear too, is it's like, okay, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. You know, trying to explain it as fast as you can before, you know, somebody punches you in the face. And uh <laughs> But yeah, it, it, you know, it, it always worked out. It always turned out okay. So yeah. <laughs> oh, related question. Someone wanted to know if you had an if you had an expectation of how people were going to react, or was it just let's go out there and see what happens? 
Yeah, I, I totally did. Um, right out of college, I got a job at the National Museum of American Indians, um, the inaugural year that it opened. And I was part of an all native staff that worked on the ground floor with the general public. Um, I learned in that year, uh, traumatically, that uh, Americans are kind of awful when it comes to their understanding of native people. And if you give them enough leeway, they'll say and do some terrible things, even to a plain clothed uh, native person. And um, so I knew this would work just simply because of that. And it's amplified in Washington, D.C. Uh, by the Washington football team. Uh, I mean, maybe not now, you know, they changed it last year. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I knew it was going to work and, um, and that's why I, that's why I went forward with it, but it's also why, um, I didn't ask anybody permission to do it because it just, you know, it looks like a bad idea on, on the surface. <laughs> okay. We have a thought provoking one here for you. Okay. What's the vision for indigenous futures to be free of colonial power or to have a healthier coexistence with colonial power? What do you think the goal is in our daily activism? Good grief. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, so much of this is hard, you know, and I know that you you read that statement to begin with, and I use the word decolonize. And uh, Merv and I have had this discussion about this word, um, this word that's that's seemingly an important concept, but ironically is wholeheartedly defined in English. It's strange that you're trying to decolonize, but you have to say it in the decolon or in the colonizer's tongue uh, to actually even define it and what that means. Um, and I think that that is really hard because we have been defined, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, um, through colonial eyes for you know 500 years. And it becomes difficult to remove yourself from that and to look at that. Um, you know, we've had eras of self-determination and uh, I think that now especially we're in these really interesting spaces because we're losing a lot of our enrolled members because there's a lot of mixing happening and mixing doesn't necessarily mean, you know, marrying or, or being with non-natives. The system that's set up in the United States uh, for tribal enrollment and for um, any sort of recognition is based on a losing concept of blood quantum and uh, that you have to be a certain amount of that tribe in order to belong to that tribe, which by the way, has nothing to do with DNA and has everything to do with knowing who your family is and being able to genealogically, uh, you know, prove that you are who you are uh, through family ties. Um, but that process, you know, it's like, it's, it's a wholehearted, you know, Western uh, colonial process of believing that you can only belong to one community, you can only have this much, you know, and every tribe is different, but you can only belong uh, to this community if you have this much in you. Um, and what that does is it, it separates people like I know people who are full blooded native, but have like four or five different, you know, community bloodlines in, in their line. Um, and they don't have enough of one bloodline to belong to their to their tribal community or to any tribal community. And so these systems need to be, uh, we need to, to, to separate ourselves from those systems um, to be more self-determining. Uh, Trump really illustrated how uh, incredibly important that is last year when, when they did the uh, shutdown, the government shutdown uh, was at last January or so. And um, there are so many aspects of, um, there's so many things that native communities are reliant upon uh, that are helping, they're receiving help from the federal government, all those things froze. And it was, it was such a long shutdown because um, there's always a shutdown every couple of years of some kind, but this shutdown was so long that like in my community, they couldn't, uh, they didn't have access to prescriptions. So diabetes, uh, blood pressure, heart disease, you know, all of these different things that are life-saving medicines um, that are being supplemented by the federal government under their federal trust obligations are now not available. There's other tribes that were losing their police departments, that were losing uh, ambulance services, that were losing um, shelter services and food services. Every tribe is different. Our tribe is pretty well outfitted 
and has good relationships to be able to help with those things, but had this one thing, which was uh, which was prescriptions that they that they received federal help for. Um, and so the reliant that we have on these Western, you know, power structures, uh, I think have have really done us a disservice. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't. I think that's a really thoughtful question. I don't know what the answer is, um, because I myself sometimes have a difficult time thinking about the future without thinking about it in colonial terms. Um, but maybe that's what makes it so important. You know, we need to define ourselves. You can see it. Young people don't care. They are just pushing through, and they are holding their identity, and they're. Uh, they are uh, fighting against the things that they think is important. And, and I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, I'm happy to sit in the back seat and let these young people drive this thing forward because they've got the momentum to make it happen. Um, but I don't know if I have a proper answer to that question other than that tirade I just went on. <laughs> I mean, you need to, ty tirades are an answer. I mean, these are not <laughs> true false questions here. Um, you want to talk about Dances with Wolves? I'm scrolling up here. Did that help or hurt? To talk about Dan uh, as far as dances with Dances with Wolves is important within the realm of filmmaking because it was um, it was the most authentic to date, and it's the first time you're hearing uh, full conversations in uh, Indigenous languages in a mainstream film that was. Um, ultimately you know won an oscar but at the end of the day it is a quintessential uh white savior trope film um it's about a white dude that suffers in behalf of natives and frankly is more more native than any native that was ever native like him and daniel day lewis and a myriad of white men that um that are just really good at being being indian uh so i think it's important it has an important place i guess but if you haven't seen that movie in a while, you should watch it. It hasn't aged well at all. It's actually really problematic. <laughs> I'm scrolling through. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Somebody likes the necklace. Thank you. <laughs> um, this makes it more like we're in the theater chatting with people on the way out. Um, you know, what we will, Greg, I'll share with you all these comments. We'll get them printed up because there have been a lot of comments, just not questions for you, but just a lot of appreciation for your time and for the film you made and for sharing your thoughts. Um, Jean, one of the questions that I saw that I think uh, made me ponder, and I'd love to know the, the answer, um, or at least an answer, is that we're starting to see a shift into uh, in the the racial discussions that our our society is having and that we're having as a culture? Um, how and I'll include myself in this. How can uh, BIPOC and other other minorities be more inclusive in those conversations? Because as we saw in the film, it's not just uh, people who look a certain way, who come from a certain origin, that are are making these assumptions and erasing identities. How can we do better? I think um, I think it's actually a really important question. You know, Black Lives Matter on their sort of second runaround. You know, in their first runaround, I'll point this out. In their first runaround, I was in Washington D.C. because I lived there for almost 17 years, and I had some friends that were um, on the forefront of that that asked me to come out. Um, and at the time, it wasn't called Black Lives Matter it, when it first started. Uh, if any of you guys remember, it, it was called I Can't Breathe. Um, making a, a statement about the the gentleman that was that was choked to death in uh, in New York City, um, Eric Gardner, I believe his name was, yeah. um, and uh, they asked me to come out, and they'd already been sort of shutting down. There's like one main road from Northern Virginia into Washington D.C., which is right turns into what's called 14th Street, which goes right onto the National Mall, and um, one of the things that happened was. Um, I saw pictures from it and like half the people that were out there uh, that were black bodies that were meant to be out there, you know, making a statement about black lives um, were also wearing Washington Redskins jackets and hats and, and hoodies and, and what have you. And so I think 
there's a couple of things to, to note. Um, we need to take stock of our own communities and where we have gone wrong. Uh, all of which our wrongs are wholeheartedly informed by the colonial power structures that have been forced upon us. Um, there is uh, at one time, and younger generations like my generation and younger are not having the same issue nearly as, as much as the older issues or the older generations. Um, there's a lot of prejudice towards uh, LGBTQ plus and prejudice towards, towards black people, particularly um, mixed native and, and black people. And so we need to own that and uh, we need to call that out. And we need to say that, that this is not right, that this has happened. And all of that is wholeheartedly informed by boarding schools, which were run under religious institutions that had been used to inundate young children with Judeo-Christian ideas um, of what is right and what is wrong and what is holy and what is evil and all of those things. And of course that is informed by white supremacy and has informed this prejudice towards uh, black people in the United States. Um, we're seeing enormous change, enormous change. I'm watching my oldest daughter who's 14 and um, there's stuff she's doing where I'm just like, I'm checking myself on what she's doing. It's, it's incredible what our young people know. And, um, and I think that we need to just follow suit, but we have to just own the things that we own. You know, there are uh, what we call blood myths that exist where um, people believe that they have native bloodlines and they are just simply not true. Um, among white folks below, below the Mason-Dixon line, they all believe that they're part Cherokee, which has a historical reference to it. Uh, when, they're re, um, when they were reestablishing the South after the Civil War, people had claims to land and they would say, my great, great grandmother was part Cherokee, specifically to lay claim that we've been here for so long that we have claims to land. And likewise, with a lot of black folks, there has been uh, mixing and things that have happened. Um, but the number of black folks that actually have native blood is really, really small, like, like 1% small. And um, and so we just need to reconcile those things because uh, we are having a shared experience. There's different experiences, but there's also a very shared American experience um, so we can support one another better. I think the best way to support one another is to recognize those things and to ask questions and to be respectful in the way that we ask questions. We need to communicate with one another absolutely 100%. Let, let me weigh in a little bit on this, Greg, uh, as well. Um, one of the things we're, uh, we're, we're trying to do in the work that uh, we're doing uh, is to, uh, in a sense, uh, stop the reification of white as, as, as a racial category. And, and I say that, uh, I think, based primarily on where I come from. I, I come from uh, Hawaii where you have uh, just a, a, a heck of a lot of uh, uh, mixing. And most folks who came to these United States, for example, uh, from what we call Italy now, they, they didn't come as Italian. They came as from as Sicilians or from other parts of, of Italy. They came with their own uh, holidays. They came with their own uh, saints. Uh, they came with their own uh, food. And we've lost that because part of of becoming American seems to be this kind of wiping out this erasure of these kinds of uh, uh, of memories of the, these kinds of identities, uh, and I think, for, from from my perspective, it uh, it does the the ancestors of folks from Sicily or uh, from Brittany a disservice than to, for us to say, okay, you know, I'm Hawaiian, Puerto Rican, Filipino, 
uh, but you're white. So I, I think it's important for us to, to as, a, as a nation, to, to understand there's an incredible diversity of cultures, of, of peoples uh, that make up the United States. And, uh, but, you know, let's, let's not for, forget that. Absolutely. And I, I learned that every time that we're, we're in these, uh, these, this particular program, um, again, I, and I've said this before, it's amazing to me as someone who is not indigenous, but someone who is a, a Latina person of color, how similar the stories are throughout all of our, our backgrounds. Uh, the, are you really, are you mixed with something? What, you know, that, that purity testing, um, that, that affects of course, to, to various degrees, as we saw in that, that film. So thank you, you all for being here to, to start that discussion. I want to acknowledge that we are over time, um, but I want to give you all some space to uh, answer any questions that are still outstanding that you saw in the chat or any final thoughts. There's one that I want to ask, and I want to ask it and answer it, and then I'll ask Greg to weigh in, but it's uh, what best ways to support Native art, and my answer is buy it. I mean, you got to, you got to support the the creative output if you want people to have the wherewithal to keep making art. Greg, you need to, you want to add to that? I don't see any reason to beat a dead horse. You got it. <laughs> well, and with that, gregdeal.com. And as we close, so let me show you. I, I brought this, one of my favorite pieces of Greg's art that lives in my living room that I love dearly. So we'll, we'll go out on a piece of your art as soon as Merv rolls the camera around. Oh, that looks good. Oh, we need to be bigger. Yep. We need to be on the... As they're doing that, Greg, I just wanna say thank you one more time. I will absolutely send you these, uh, these uh, comments in this chat because of their they're all acknowledging how important that this film was and how amazing that being able to, to experience it was. How was it for you after seeing it after a couple of years? Uh, weird, I don't like hearing my voice, but uh, you know, it does It does what it does. And uh, I, I really appreciate being here and, and appreciate the comments very much. Well, thank you all. Merv, Gene, any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Well, there's a, a comment from, uh... Some uh, person named Bauer, who's uh, part Hawaiian. Uh, well, just uh, you have our uh, our uh, contact information, I think. Uh, so uh, we'd be uh, interested in uh, uh, hearing from you directly. And that is a great ping. Let me go ahead and copy. The link into the chat as well. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, again, I'm so grateful for these important conversations and getting to, to experience them with all of you. Uh, we have a bunch of, of links in that chat. My encouragement is that we take it beyond that land acknowledgement. We take it beyond tonight's program. We take it beyond tonight's Zoom meeting. And uh, those are a great place to start. Um, support Native art, support Native voices, elevate them. Thank you all. If you are, uh, if you're tuned in tonight, you'll get an email with a survey. We learn from those surveys. They help us understand how to best uh, bring these programs to you. We miss you all in person, but our next one will be virtual uh, on March 10th. So keep an eye out on our websites for more information for that. We'll go ahead and roll out our PowerPoint um, and say goodbye to everybody. Good night. Thanks, Greg. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>